Many thanks for you coming here. Um, I apologize in advance in case this does not make the most of sense because it's currently a work in progress. Now, placing a difficult guess the presence of Russians in 19th century Kyrgyzstan poetry might not be the most um, stimulating of titles, but I hope it says what I wish to do. Now, my background is history and medieval literature. And one of the things that I find myself doing here is trying to employ this methodology onto the material of corpus of, of Manus. Now, um, my thesis statement, get it in quickly, Manus material collected in the 19th century records Kyrgyz views regarding the increasing presence of Russian colonialism. Now, Manas is typically seen as a compendium, a collection of Kyrgyz history of the 8th, 12th, 14th centuries. And what I would like to suggest as well is that rather than look at this speculative view of Kyrgyz history, we can use it to record and investigate views which the Kyrgyz audiences and the Kyrgyz performers had at the time the stories were told. Now, this is part of a, a research group based at AUSA called the Analyzing Kyrgyz Narratives Research Group. The first publication I was hoping to show to you today, um, but unfortunately the publication has been delayed. Um, and what we did was we analyzed modern performers. Um, we took various transcriptions and um, run them through plagiarism software to see formulas and selections. Now, I will be hopefully, if you're, if you're willing, hopefully talk about this when it's in print. Now, I will be using, because most of this is text, 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 for a bit of change for you to see this, I'm using photographs taken from the collection of Georgi Almashi, who was a Hungarian explorer who came to Central Asia at the start of the 20th century. Um, and I've got a research project in Budapest which is looking at his collection. I don't believe much of these are known in, in Kyrgyzstan, so one idea which we're proposing is an exhibition of his material. Um, <clears throat> I will shoehorning in um, biography. I will have a fellowship in Leiden in the coming months where I will be doing digital analysis of 19th century Kyrgyz literature, where again I'm using computer software to analyze this material. Um, now, some of my colleagues and some of my students asked me the question, do you actually read a word of Manas or do you just do computer analysis? And to answer this criticism, I've decided to discuss a single word in Manas, um, which is Oros. Here's the definition from Yurikin, which, as you can see, is clearly Russian. And this is a, an interesting, provocative issue because, of course, the Russians, as we know, <coughs> became part of Central Asian history pretty much in the 19th century with colonization. So if Manas describes the 8th, 14th, 12th centuries, they should not be there. Yeah? So what we have to do then is work out what are they doing there and how do we assess what's their presence. Now the first version which was collected was 1856 by Chokon Valikhanov, and he collected a version called the Moral Feast of Kokotoy Khan. This does not feature um, this does not feature the word Oros, but I'm including it because it has the difficult guest of the title. Because in the memorial feast, they invite people, and the first person who gets invited is a person of Kazakh ethnicity to assist. And this appears to be the Kyrgyz performer trying to win sympathy from the Kazakh officer in the Tsarist officials. Now, the versions which I will be looking at in this talk will be those collected by Radloff in 1862 and 1869. Now, um, this, these are the versions he collected. Um, this is Valakarnov at the top. And these are the ones which mention, um, these are the ones which mention Oros Russians. Interestingly, these ones don't, which we'll discuss later. 
And he also collected Jolai Kang at Tostok, which I have not yet had the chance to look at. So this is quite speculative. Now, have a following. Now, these are the Bugu tribes who he collected. He also collected from the Sari Bagus tribe. And we have a photograph from um, Almashi of the Sari Gabis tribe. Um, again, I don't know whether this photograph is known in Kyrgyzstan. This is why I would love to exhibit them here. Um, this here is, if you're wondering, this is the um, archive number of the photograph. Um, now, the main enemy of Manas in the 19th century versions are the Kalmaks. Now, the Kalmaks are a curious group because in some parts they have Mongolian features and in other parts they have Chinese features. They're a mishmash. And again, we're fortunate with Almashi to have photographs of Kalmaks in the 19th century. Um, and you can see in terms of dress and style and status, there's visual differences. But we also have the Oros, the Russians. Now, the texts which I'll be using, Radloff printed in Russian in 1885. He also printed it in German, but I'm not using the German edition. I'm using Hatto's 1990 edition of the Kyrgyz text in, in Latin script and English translation. So you'll be seeing a Cyrillic version with Radloff's, um, which Radloff altered to accommodate Kyrgyz. Kyrgyz text in Latin script, which Hatto did, and then Hatto's translation. So if we take the first story, which Radloff collected in 1862, Alembet comes to Manas. The Russians appear in formulaic sections. Formulaic sections in oral poetry are when you have these phrases which are repeated and repeated. And this suggests that they were learnt phrases which could be employed whenever the performer needed them. Um, this suggests that Kyrgyz oral poetry, already in the 1860s, had adapted to include the presence of Russians. And interestingly, in, one point two, in, in this, this story, the Russians are presented as a military force, and they're also presented as being quite clever. Um, if we take this one, um, here we have Orustum, um, and we have... Then an Aorus army of ten myriads lay in Alembet's path. What do I mean by formulaic expression? Because we have the same statement repeated later. This is 260, 65 line, 272, 74 line. And we have it repeated again. So this is a line, this is an image, which gets repeated by the performer in the text. So this is the Russians being militaristic. This is the Russians being clever. Um, Akalpok, which is Manas's armor. Um, the performer, the Kyrgyz performer says, it's made by Chinese armorers with their skill, Russians masters with their cunning, Kalmak masters with their guttural songs. An interesting bit of 19th century Kyrgyz racism here. And what's quite striking is when it gets repeated, the Kalmak insult disappears, but the Russian detail is still considered to be important. So we can see that Russians, already in this first story, have a significant presence in the narratives. Um, if we go to the next text, Duel Between Manas and Kokol, again collected 1862, we have this curious figure of a white Padisha. Um, Padisha is kind of Kyrgyz attempt to translate czar. Um, interestingly, this term gets used later when some Kyrgyz tribesmen, uh, chieftains send a letter to the czar and they address it as white pad to the white padisha. Um, much of the descriptions of Manas being submissive to the white padisha figure correspond with the descriptions of submission of the chieftain Yante to um, the Khanates. Now, 
The performer repeatedly states that Russians are not targets of Manas's ambitions. The Padisha, as a character, is quite Turkic in idealization, whereas the Russians are perhaps stereotypically presented as being bearded and interested in vodka. Now, their appearance, Radloff was kind of confused by the presence of Russians in this, this story which he transcribed, and he assumed that the performer altered the text, altered the story involving Manas to, to accommodate the presence of Radloff, who he assumed to be a Russian official. Now, the great extent of the references, um, I'm glad we have one of my students here because he calculated how many times White Padisha gets mentioned, and it's about 300 times in this text. It's a lot. Now, the fact that it's been included so much perhaps suggests that this story was a familiar plea to a Russian patron to support, or more likely, rather than being for a Russian audience, a plea for a Kyrgyz audience to become sympathetic to having Russian rulers. Yeah? It will make sense when I show you the text, I promise. Here we have part of the six, part of the text. Manas, he alarmed the world and terrified men one and all, but he submits to the white padisha. Here we have the white padisha who has a noble feast. Manas submitted to the white padisha. A sash of honor gets tied around Manas's waist. He's become the white padisha's subject. Manas is not the most powerful ruler here. The white padisha is. And this imagery corresponds with the imagery of Yante being in submission to the Khanates. Um, this is where we have the curious bits with the Russians. We has a gleaming corslet. The white padisha and Manas were on level terms. Mounting his horse, Manas did not trot, but he did not come to make war on the Russians. Manas led these people <coughs> apart from the Russians. Those people, other than the Russians, Manas bangs their heads in submission. So in the space of a few lines, we get Russians, Russians, Russians. And the Russians are always the exception. And Radloff, listening to this performer, got the impression that he was speaking directly. Manas is off to kill all these people, but not the Russians, but not the Russians, but not the Russians. Yeah. Um, who you've got it simply put, you went to the White Padisha and made him gifts of honor. Um, curiously, when Manas gets wounded and is about to die, he calls upon Allah, but he also calls upon his friend, the White Padisha. Um, I'm quite curious how you would read this. If we continue on, um, Manas comes back to life. He then decides to be more warlike and wants to crush the Tajiks, destroy the Chinese. But for the White Padisha's people, with their hairy mouths, these are the bearded Russian stereotypes, a feast has been set. So he's never going to attack the Russians. With a waist around the sash of honor, I've become a peaceful fellow subject with the White Padisha's people. So again, we have this narrative being altered to accommodate the presence of Russians. Um, my White Padisha gave him all nations but the Russians, all save the White Padisha's people. As you can see, it's repetitive, 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 repetitive in this version. Um, when Manas thinks he's going to die again, he's on his deathbed and he says, don't go to these people, don't go to these people, my people, go and submit to the Russians. Go and bow your head to the white Padisha. He wears locks on his head that none cut off. He say he wears his locks uncut. Again, this obsession with hair. And then we have this curious bit the Russian people are compassionate. Join and make your home among the Russians. Go to the white Khan and eat this food. Again, the imagery of the Khanate submission. But then we've got the very curious part. Um, the Khan will, uh, the, the white Palash will take off his robe, give it away, settle down among the Russians. When drinking vodka steam comes out, if when eating bulk water comes out, shout your cry of Almanbet, shout your cry of Ajube, shout your cry of Ermanas. So the Padisha, the, the, the Russians are presented as being incredibly friendly, incredibly accommodating, and they will feed you vodka 
if you go and submit to them. Um, it's translated as vodka, but it's, it's Arak in, in the Kyrgyz. Yeah? So you can see that the Russians have an incredibly large presence in a narrative where they perhaps shouldn't be. Um, is that clear? Yeah? Now, what's quite striking is that the next text, which Radloff collected in 1862, is a narrative called Bokhmarun. And this was a text which is the second variant because Valikhanov collected the same text, the same story, earlier in 1856. So we have two versions from the same tribe, six years apart. So it's a retelling. And in the earlier version, Manas's rival, Joloy, is a Kalmak, who you saw a picture of earlier. In Radloff's version, Joloy is Russian. Yeah, which is quite a change. And now part of the plot only makes sense if Joloy is Kalmak. There's a bit where Almanbet suggests that the, his, his spy should dress in Kalmak fashion to spy on Joloy. This wouldn't work if Joloy is Russian. So we have here a performer changing the ethnicity of the character but not changing the content. Now, Jolo also wrestles in Kalmak style. This has confused editors. It confused Radloff, and it confused Hatto, who said that this looks like a strange lapse by the performer. Um, he says it could be done humorously or inadvertently, and he suggests that the text would become tolerable if we changed the word olos which is a, a Mongolian tribe. Now, Hato was not really sure whether he could do this, so he suggested perhaps there was a resemblance between Joloi and some hearty Russian frontier types. So this is a, a very strange change which scholars have looked at and thought, how do we explain this? Is this the performer making a mistake? Is this the performer changing something to make a joke? Is this the performer doing something odd? Now, my suggestion is that this is a comment on the presence of Radloff to the performer, and it's a possible hostile variant of the White Parisha. So this is a performer who's very dismissive of the Russian presence, in contrast to the previous performer who was very supportive of the Russian presence. Now, we can see this because here we have Joloi's invitation to the feast. Big Joloi, Khan of the Oros, Ostan Khani, and he's described as the leader of the infidel people, which is his typical expression. And so what we have here, quite fascinatingly, is Joloi connected to the infidels, connected to the Russians. And we know this is deliberate. Um, this is Hato saying, Oros normally indicates the Russians. We know this is deliberate because much later in the text, they re, the performer restates the fact that Joloi was Russian. So it's not an accident, it's a deliberate choice. We also know this because when there's a, a, a horse riding game, Hato's plan to put Oirot in doesn't really work because we have both ethnicities here. So clearly the performer knew the difference between the two he really wanted to stress the fact that Joloi was Russian. So this appears to be a kind of subtle joke at Radloff's expense and perhaps on the Russians who are being presented not as being kind, um, what's the word, sorry, my English is dying, um, kind um, rulers who give vodka if you ask, but rather leader of an infidels who's greedy and wants to conquer and conquer and conquer. In Koskoman, we have a minor character made Urs. This is possibly, though, a slip in alliteration and assimilation. And it's such a short one, Oruk Batur of the Urs. Um, it should be Nogay, but they've made it Orstan 
possibly for a literature effect. It's not really clear. It's a very brief inclusion. So we have, in these stories which we've mentioned, we've had um, Russians being appearing as a formula. We've had Russians appearing as gentle, generous hosts. We've had Russians as critical, greedy characters. And we've had Russians seemingly assimilated into the text. Yeah. Now, Radloff also collected Birth of Semite, Semite in 1862, the Birth of Manas, Otostok, and Jolokan in 1869. There's no Russians in the Birth of Semite and in Semite, but the story describes a fear of extinction because the Kyrgyz could be wiped out given the situation in the 1860s. Can we read this, admittedly it's arguing from absence, as a view that the Russians presence in Central Asia was considered transitory. 1869, Radloff returns. It's a short 164-line poem. Again, doesn't mention the Russians, but the locations of the forthcoming raids, which Manas will do, are nearby recent Russian settlements. And the tradition of Kazakh, holy raiding, had recently been outlawed. So perhaps we can read this version as a defiant polemic against the Russian settlement. The performer is telling Radloff, who he assumes to be Russian, this is our land, this is our tradition, we're going to continue this, whether you're here or not. Uh, Tustok, though, escape his fantasy. Jolai Khan, again, it's the character who was previously Russian. Here, he's now the same ethnicity of Manus. And even though he's fat, even though he's useless, even though he's... A, he's um, a, a figure of comedy, he's the hero. Um, he's bloated, walks rather than rides, and all his wives do the work. So we have a kind of rejection of the former narratives of heroism into a kind of irony. And we can perhaps, I say perhaps with a stress on the perhaps, view this as a kind of ironic acceptance of vassal status so they can no longer sing about heroes because there's no time for heroes. The situation has changed so much, they can just be secondary citizens. Now, if I can push this a little further, and I apologize how much, if I can push this a little further just to see how far we can go. Um, what can we do with the previous mentions of the Russians in the Manas texts? Well, can we compare it to other Kyrgyz sources of the period? We can perhaps compare it to the Zazaman poets. Astenbeck's Tarzaman features a Sari Russian, and Kalagubay Ulus, Russians will take your land, break your back, heed your words, or you will see your end. Now, if we compare what's going on in the Manas texts collected by Radloff with these poets, perhaps we can establish a class tribal distinction regarding attitudes to the Russians. Again, I'm stressing the word perhaps. What about popular songs and folklore? Um, one text which is not known because it was collected by Almashi, and Almashi, instead of publishing it in German, like he did with his version of Manas, he published it in Hungarian, and very few people <laughs> consider Hungarian to be a scholarly language. We have a lovely example of a, a Kyrgyz folk song with Hungarian translation, which mentions, admittedly, it's a Russian horse, but we still have the appearance of Russian quite early in the text. So can we see if there's a, a distinction between popular song and perhaps elite performances? Again, this would show us different attitudes to colonization. Um, Another thing perhaps we can do is look at the role of the performer and look at the role of the intermediary between the Kyrgyz tribes and the Russians and the foreigners. Um, here we have Turgan. Um, next to him are Almashi's two sons. One of them is Laszlo Almashi. Turgan appears to be the first Kyrgyz person to go to Europe. Um, he gets taken to teach these two boys Russian. He also sings, according to a newspaper report, 
he sings performances of Kyrgyz songs outside of Budapest in 1900. Um, but he disappears from the record, so if any of you know this guy, please tell us, it would be lovely. Um, but we can also look at Russians in the later period, at the turn of the 19th, 20th century, for the creation of an imagined community of Kyrgyzness and the forging of an identity. Um, this is the Saban Batir Codex, the printed by Brill, and this is the Saban Batir Codex, the manuscript in the National Archives here. Um, this is the lovely text. Um, the doors are locked. I expect the translation in about five minutes. Is that fine? And here we have Manas, and we have Manas Noigoi, which is his ethnicity, and someone has tried to remove it because we have the period when Manas changes his ethnicity to becoming Kyrgyz. Um, now, the reason I'm including this is because this is the, the poet saying, I want the heroes of the Kyrgyz to be praised. There's stories written about the Kazakhs and the Noigoi, but I've never seen one about the Kyrgyz. Um, and there is the section where he says, write down everything that the Russians have written about. So we can ask ourselves, what is the role of the Russians in this enterprise? Um, any idea of this one? This is the first text written by a Kyrgyz, which is a transcription of a version of Semite from 1899 by Maldabe Borzo Ulu. And this is at the top is Kissa of Semite. Um, and the reason I'm including this is because we have other versions of Semite. Again, these are versions of Kyrgyz poetry published in, um, this is published in Ufa, and this is Semite published in Moscow, one 1911, one 1925. Um, sorry. And how did people how did the Kyrgyz of the time see the relationship between Russian printers, Kyrgyz poets? And we can see this perhaps interestingly finalized in the last section. Um, this is Orezbekov's version. Um, here we have lovely, lovely Arabic script handwriting. And can you see the watermark of the ham and sickle at the top? We have this section where Orezbekov is simply listing all these different groups of people. But notice the ones right at the bottom. Kite, the Chinese, the Kazakhs, but we've also got the Oros, the Russians, and the Nemes, the Germans. So we've got all these people who he's become sympathetic to, but the Russians and the Germans are put with the old enemies, of the Kazakhs, and the Chinese. So what we can do by looking at this single word, this single terminology, is plot a kind of history of changing attitudes towards different groups from the 1860s to the 1920s. Um, my apologies for the rushing. Any, you still have time for your translations if you wish. 